can NATO survive the shifting political order? In a less orderly world, of course, it's very difficult for um, NATO to survive in the, in the way it is today as an organization, as a military uh, um, a cooperation organization. I think the biggest impediment to NATO's sustainability, durability in the long haul is the failure of some of the member states to adapt to their, and to uphold their commitments. Four years ago, at the Wales summit, the NATO alliance committed itself, each member state, to spending 2% of GDP on defense as uh, their contribution. Today, only five NATO states, the United States, the United Kingdom, Poland, Greece, and Estonia meet that threshold. I think it's very difficult today for NATO to project an image of a beacon of liberal democracy when you have at least one member country which is destroying the rule of law, another member country which happens to be an EU <clears throat> member which is slowly also destroying the rule of law. Ca I mean, care to name any it. of these people? What? <laughs> care to name any of these countries? Yeah, Turkey and Hungary. Sure. I don't have a shadow of a doubt that NATO will survive. We need to adapt this institution. That does not mean that we should destroy them. By the way, if we were to recreate UN today, we couldn't. We would not be able. So before we destroy anything that doesn't work entirely well, let's think about the alternative. It's great to be here, folks. Thank you to the Atlantic Dialogues. Thank you to the Policy Center for the New South. I try to be rational and put the ideas in certain order. And I say, well, they are asking us to talk of two seas, well, one sea and one ocean, Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Well, in the history, Mediterranean was the center of the world. We have to say that. We are lucky, the Mediterraneans, during many centuries. But uh, recent his history has produced that uh, the Mediterranean was part of the bipolar world. And I think it was Atlantic, it was the US, who rule and was capable to dominate, you know, the geopolitics of the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. The session before that, the moderator mentioned something about NATO and what the NATO has done in the Mediterranean by way of uh, uh, showing the positive side. And it mentioned that uh, uh, the NATO contributed in eliminating Colonel Gaddafi. But then what after that? In fact, they created a major problem in Libya, in North Africa, and in Africa, and in fact, in the whole basin of the Mediterranean. I would warn now, don't draw Africa into the upcoming Cold War. I see something dangerous very much coming up in Africa, involving Africa, and I believe we in Africa will have to be very worried about that and very cautious about that, not to stop cooperation. We have to cooperate even with NATO, but we have to know our limits and the, the slippery ground which we have to avoid. Okay. All right, as we're setting up, does anyone have a comment right now? I'm sure you do. Uh, my name is Youssef Almorani. I'm former Minister Director of Foreign Affairs of Morocco. So I think today we have to talk about everything, but the most important is we have failed today in our region to, when I'm talking region, mean north and south. Yeah, yeah. Lack of ambition of the European Union as far as neighborhood policy. We didn't, take, didn't talk about it. The gentleman up front here says lack of leadership, lack of vision, <coughs> and lack of commitment. Do you guys agree? <laughs> Madam Busset, do you agree? Uh, he's, he's my boss. I can't <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Your boss is in the front row. <laughs> Maybe you should take a coffee break. Hiram <laughs> Diop. Yes. Um, I have traveled the world, and there's probably no country on the planet that I've been to haven't found a Senegalese there. <laughs> I don't know why, and Senegal is a pretty stable country. So, I mean, it's, uh, what's the problem? <laughs> Your chief of staff is the president, so you should know. Huh? <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, provocation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just would like to highlight the fact that it's not because people feel discriminated or feel not at ease or feel that their basic human rights are violated or they are uh, running out of hunger, that they are migrating. The refugee system 
is uh, going broke. It's fundamentally underfunded and uh, not capable of meeting its demands. And I think the sooner we get down to talking about very specific issues, which I think on the council we discovered in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas, everywhere, that there is simply uh, a major fall off of uh, commitments. We have to see how we can uh, create, uh, how can we uh, combat the origin and the, the root reasons of the immigration. Mm. The question of development, we, we talk about that. How can we create more opportunities of job? How can we create more st political stability? That's, that's the point. This great liberal order that we talk about, it wasn't such a great order depending on where you come from. You know, in the American Congress, they have a saying which is, where you stand depends on where you sit. If you sit in India, it didn't look such a, like such a great uh, order. It did not look very liberal because it was so selective in its application. It didn't look very orderly from the point of view of many countries uh, where uh, the interventions uh, from the West, sometimes led by the Americans, and not always led by the Americans, didn't bring about order. What we're seeing is the US-led order with its network of alliances, especially with Europe and, North and uh, East Asia, but elsewhere as well, um, is being replaced by great power rivalry. You're seeing the United States and China, to some extent the United States and Russia, India emerging as, a, as an important power, Europe and Japan as important economic powers. But we're going back from a world of multilateral institutions and rules shaping the world to one where might is right and where power is being asserted, particularly in the US-China relationship. The question is, what would the world be like if China were on the driving seat? Go ahead, Hubert. Moi, je, je pense que le chaos va continuer, en fait. Uh -huh. Et je pense que les États-Unis ne redeviendront jamais le maître du jeu. Je pense que les Occidentaux, globalement, non plus. La Chine, non plus. La Chine a une ascension extraordinaire, mais qui va provoquer des réactions. Les émergents entre eux ne sont pas d'accord entre eux, en fait. Et donc, je pense qu'il y aura un système très compliqué, très confus, très durable. Et je ne crois pas qu'il y aura une puissance qui sera l'équivalent des États-Unis de 1945 ou de la décennie 90. Même pas la Chine. Um, what should a new social contract look like um, for um, politics in the digital age? I think if there's going to be a new social contract, it's not going to be between citizens and the political and economic elite, but between citizens and each other. That, I think, is a powerful idea, because right now, as you know, my, my panelists, my fellow panelists have said, there's a crisis of trust. And we cannot create new agreements uh, with people who don't trust each other. You don't, you don't enter an agreement with someone you can't trust. You don't make a contract with someone you don't trust. So if there is going to be a social contract, it's not going to be between a power elite in Paris, Brussels, and Washington, D.C., and everybody else, but between citizens and each other. That, I think, is a promising idea. There are ways in which you can get more people to participate, and I think that participation should lead to changes in policy because mm -hmm. those are going to be the transformative uh, uh, changes in the future. Not the social the app and the social media, which are fine and nice, but they're going to give you access to a restaurant you know, at 2 a.m. in the morning. They're not going to address security. They're not going to address your rights. They're not going to address yeah. service, public, access to public services like healthcare or education at a massive level. There are um, a certain number of risks that could pose themselves. I'm talking about technological risk. So for example, you could have some algorithm going uh, wrong in stock markets. Yeah. You could have cybersecurity risks, which are new to everyone. You have to learn how to cope, cope with them. And uh, let me say that maybe the, the, the thing that we, the event that will trigger the, the crisis, we won't talk about it today because it will be a black swan, something that no one is not expecting. Right. <laughs> yeah. I would like you to really understand that when the United States sneezes, we catch a very strong cold. You know, so for us, monitoring what is happening in the U.S. is extremely important. Three hot spots we have to look at. Borrowing, as you correctly stated, Jinka. Housing and un unemployment. One major responsible actor for the ripple effects uh, through the system is no longer there. Banks, including particularly European banks, 
obviously what we heard is uh, if we go back uh, since the 2008 great financial crisis, it is clear that uh, a lot has happened from uh, the developed uh, nations to deal with this accumulation of risks uh, that have been uh, accumulating over decades. And then they erupted in 2007, 2008. Uh, and this is actually, it was clear that some of the risks uh, that haven't been even known or managed properly. What did we learn in the last crisis? The last crisis, first we had Basel III, which strengthened banks, the regulation, and the dynamics by which now those risks are more visible, you know, to take away the invisibility of those risks. Then also we had better coordination and we had people like Bernanke, who was the president, the chair, I'm sorry, of the Fed, who could take technical actions because he had 30 years experience in crisis. So he could act immediately together with the treasury. But what happens when you don't have that luck of having a good team, a good technical team and good response, and you are bound by populism, what would be the metric to take then action within either a crisis that is in full blown or just starting or a micro crisis? Right. Because then the parameters are more subjective, maybe more guarding interests instead of national visions. So that is my, my worst fear. Thank you.